way to deal the love beyond toleration be the love before pride and exaltation be the love be the love be the hope you are listening to be the love transcending through the shadows into a higher state of consciousness. We are souls on the journey, opening up the conversation to heal, awaken, and connect ourselves and the planet to a higher vibration of love frequency. It starts with you. Everything you need is within you. This is your time. I am Stacy Musial. And I am Sam Fernandez. And we are your co-hosts at Be The Love Podcast. Thank you for tuning in and ascending with us. Hop on board the Ascension Bus. Hello and welcome to another episode of Be The Love, Transcending Through the Shadows. I am Stacey Musial. And I am Sam Fernandez. And we are your co-hosts and souls on the journey. And if it feels safe for you, just to take a moment to get centered with us. And I would like to begin by inviting you just to take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth, just letting go of anything that is keeping you from being present. And take another cleansing breath in through your nose and cleansing breath out. Just releasing anything left that is there that you are ready to let go of. Take another deep breath in through your nose. Breathing in calm, peaceful energy. And breathing out anything you are ready to let go of in this present moment. Remembering that you always have your breath to come back to. And today we have Mia Tarduno. Mia is a woman's mentor, yoga instructor, and women's gathering facilitator. Movement, creation, and gatherings have always been a part of Mia's life. As she became older, Mia realized that she that many women were experiencing discontent and disease that came from the times they felt alone, disconnected, and like they just didn't quite belong. When she found out how to work with our bodies instead of against them, everything in her views of health, relationships, work, and passions changed. Mia then created Move, Create, and Radiate to highlight the healing powers of getting back to our natural cycles through yoga, breathwork, art, and gatherings. She's found that by unearthing the taboo conversations, we can start to ward away shame, guilt, and loneliness to create a more connected community. Thank you so much for being here today with us, Mia. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you. And so let's just get started about talking about your work. And I'd just like to um, start out by asking the question, what is cyclical living? Sure, so cyclical living means really allowing for our natural rise and fall of our moods, our energy, our productivity, and our general lust for life in alignment to the way that nature has cycles. So people with menstrual cycles can use their cycle to tune into these ebbs and flows. Others can use seasons of the year or the moon cycles to align with. And this really affects all areas of our lives, our relationship, our businesses, our art, our expression, and just living in tune with how nature has its own cycles. That's, um, seems like a very, uh, you know, kind of flowy, um, kind of releasing way of, you know, living life, kind of going with the grain instead of against it. Um, so I, I wonder how our world would function differently if the cyclical living was the norm? How do you think that, you know, that would have such a, you know, dramatic change or what type of change do you think that would have on the world? Yeah, Sam, like you said, it's a really intuitive way of living. 
And as soon as I teach this, there's a lot of light bulbs that go off in people's heads. And in terms of a world that functions in a cyclical way, I could just go off on a whole fantasy for that one. But I think some of the main changes would be that we would follow things like the moon cycles and seasons instead of a man-made calendar. And this would really attune people to the changes that are happening around them so that we could really learn from nature again, like we once did as humans. I also believe that there would be less shame and judgment in general of our natural changing nature as humans. We wouldn't be expected to show up in the same way every day or to be continually productive for the rest of our lives forever. <laughs> And instead, we could honor these natural ebbs and flows of our energies and our moods that we go through as humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I really uh, uh, found what you said interesting in the in the sense of, you know, how our ancestors used to to live life. Um, you know, because I think I think we all pretty much know now that, you know, sitting in a cubicle under fluorescent lights for at least eight hours a day is not what the human body was meant to do. You know, the human body was meant to move. The human body was meant to, to kind of let, you know, flow with nature, flow with, 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 with different cycles. Um, and it seems like that more people are starting to open their eyes to that. Um, not necessarily, you know, people like, like for me, for instance, I, I was in the corporate world for a while. And then um, I moved out of the country for a while and experienced a different type of living. And when I came back, I couldn't go back to that corporate world, you know, and it was it was because, you know, of how differently I felt when I didn't have the cubicle and the fluorescent lights over me, right. you know, so and I think a lot of people are starting to, to open their eyes more to that to where there is starting to become more of a balance and people are starting to get back to kind of their more primal selves. Yeah, I think we start to notice both in our minds and our spirits and also just in the physical body that there are a lot of these diseases that are caused by the fluorescent lights, by the sitting all day, by the really stressful schedules, mm -hmm. because that can actually wreak havoc on our hormonal system. So it really is doing something to our bodies. So like you said, a lot of people who do experience something outside of a Western culture or who just can spend more time outside, whether that be on a vacation or a trip or a different experience somewhere else, I think that's a really common experience that coming back to that stressful environment, we start to realize, wait, our bodies weren't meant to live in that condition. And that can actually cause a lot of stress. And it seems like we would be able to, you know, after when we step outside of that, outside of those rhythms, the stress, the monotony of, you know, what our culture has created and really get back to to the rhythm of nature, um, being more connected with the moon and the earth um, as they are cycling as well. Yeah, I think that's the ideal. <laughs> and it's hard for some of us who do have to show up at a physical job, but there are things that we can do on a daily basis just to check in with what's happening with the moon, what's happening outside, because those are constantly changing. Even if our life may feel very static, it can be something to kind of tie onto that there are these cyclical changes happening all the time right outside our windows. Mm. And so um, one of the things that I, I saw on your blog um, that you had a blog post on how to follow the moon cycle and that we mirror the lunar cycle. Um, and so how we can actually use the lunar calendar to track and monitor energy levels, sexuality, productivity, focus, and socialization. So can you speak a little bit more about, um, about that piece? Sure. So the neat thing about the moon cycle is that anyone can follow it. So I work a lot with women. And when I work with women who have menstrual cycles, we work on the different phases of their cycle because they follow a natural hormone cycle and that can really impact things like the mood, the creativity, the productivity. However, for those who aren't experiencing a menstrual cycle because they are not in a female body or because they are pregnant or postmenopausal, everyone can follow the moon cycle. 
And so this can actually mirror a woman's menstrual cycle with the four phases. So for example, the new moon would represent menstruation. And that is generally just a time to slow and calm down. And it's a quieting. If you think of nature, if you go outside on a new moon, everything's just a little bit quieter and darker. And then moving into the waning moon, the moon starts to get a little bit bigger in the same way that a woman's hormones start to rise during this next phase. And so that's a good time for creativity. So those who want to tune into this waning moon can start to think of where new ideas are coming from at this time. Moving into the, the full moon would be a time related to that of ovulation for a woman when hormones are highest. But for anyone, this could be when energy levels are the highest. So in a lot of countries, a lot of cultures, they do full moon parties because people are into this kind of giving energy, maybe wanting to be more social, wanting to be more out in the world. And then the waxing moon is related to the premenstrual phase for women when hormones are decreasing. And for everyone, it could be a time to just start to turn inwards. So a time of reflection and discernment and starting to quiet down the life a little bit, just as if you were out in nature. And again, it's starting to get a little bit quieter and darker with each progressive night. So have you been working with people um, for a while on these, the uh, cyclical living and the cycles of living in this way? And what have you seen the benefits of someone working with the nature in this way in the cycles? Yeah, so there can be a number of benefits depending on what we're working on, but kind of across the board, just a deeper connection with how they are functioning as a human, a huge wiping out of shame is a huge uh, thing that I see kind of across the board because a lot of this dis-ease, again, of kind of what's happening in our everyday lives is caused by this shame that we feel like we shouldn't be hungry, we shouldn't be angry, we shouldn't be stressed, we shouldn't feel depressed, all of these things, but they're all part of the natural cycle. Mm -hmm. So when we start to realize and start to track, which is a big thing that I work on with clients, whether we're doing a menstrual cycle, a moon cycle, a seasons, when we start to track what's happening during different phases, it starts to really open people's eyes up to that these different things are all part of being a human. They're all part of this cycle. And there's ways to honor all of those. So there doesn't need to be this shame of times when you feel like you should or shouldn't be something because it will always come back around. It seems like it would give permission for people not to feel like they have to do all the time where there is a natural rhythm to say, go within and maybe just get, get into that quiet reflective place um, or that introspection place similar to the, you know, a larger cycle of winter. I think, um, you know, as a, as a therapist, I hear a lot of times, you know, people are overwhelmed or they feel like they, you know, it's winter, they need to get out. They're getting, you know, um, you know, antsy of, you know, by staying inside. And, and so we talk a lot about going within and taking the time to use the seasons as that natural time to go inside. And so it's rather than how our culture has created this, that shame piece, like if I'm not doing, I'm not enough then, um, but to really take that time to, to really honor that part of ourselves as, as humans. Yeah, that's such a beautiful practice. And I also think of it kind of like a spring. So sometimes when we don't have that time to rest then we don't have the time to be productive or to be out in the world. And so yes, for many of us who feel that pressure to do and do and do and show up and show up and show up, we don't have the vigor and the energy that we want to. So like you were saying, we can feel shameful that we don't have the energy or we're not getting out enough. 
but taking that time to rest is so important for the rejuvenation of our physical bodies, of our minds, of our spirits, so that when the seasons of spring and summer come, we have the energy to be able to go out. That's, uh, oh, it's just, it's, 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 um, just listening to, to, to you talking about, I don't know, it's, it's, it kind of, it taps into something for me, it taps into something, you know, natural, you know, it taps into something like my body is responding like, yes, <laughs> you know, that, that all makes sense. That all makes sense. Um, and for, for me as well, I think I'm kind of a little opposite than other people with full moon and new moon. Uh, or maybe it's just the way <laughs> my energy is at the time. But during a full moon, I am kind of like anxious and a little, you know, ah. Uh, during a new moon is when I, I actually feel my energy kind of rise up, like the more like positive energy rise up. Um, would you be able to kind of ex explain, you know, if, because I'm sure there's other people like me out there, but explain, because it feels like it's almost like a polar opposite than what other people experience during the, like the full and the new moons. Yeah, Sam, that makes a lot of sense. And I've, I've also realized a very similar pattern in men and also in some women, because what we work on, what I work on with my clients as well is eventually finding this place that we call finding home in the cycle. So it's like, what phase for you feels like home? And so for some people during a full moon or during ovulation for women, that could feel super exciting. And it could feel like they want to go out and party and be social. For some people, that extra energy can feel overwhelming, especially for those who are a bit quieter or more introverted, or those who are highly empathetic. Being out with a ton of energy can feel like, oh my gosh, this is way too much for mm -hmm. me to take on. <laughs> and so those people might actually like to retreat during the full moon because they understand that out, outside of themselves and maybe with the people around them, it can feel like a lot of energy. So it might actually be more of a time to retreat and spend actually the full moon time journaling, reflecting, kind of protecting your energy for a couple of days. And then the new moon where nature, people around might be a little bit calmer to those again, empathetic, beings or those who are more introverted, it can feel like, oh, this is comfortable to me because people mm -hmm. are a little bit quieter, maybe a little bit more dimmed down, and that can feel a little bit more natural to them. And it can also be at any point in any of the phases it can be someone's home. And that's where kind of the unique part of the phases come in, because we do as humans tend to want to find a home in that part of the cycle. And depending on what's happening in our lives as well, that could switch. So if we don't have a whole lot going on in our lives, maybe we need that excitement of the full moon during a certain part. And that feels super exciting. But to someone who maybe is taking care of a family, has a business, has a lot of things going on, it can be like, whoa, I don't want anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So and that, let me know if that makes sense to you. That actually makes total sense to me. Um, I am an empath and I am an introverted extrovert. <laughs> so that totally, totally makes sense. I really appreciate you explaining that. It's like, you know, light bulb, bing, there it went. <laughs> yes, there is nothing wrong with you. You are perfect as you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure people will appreciate that question though, because that, that comes up a lot and there is no normal. Mm. Everyone kind of deals with and feels the cycles a little bit differently. Awesome. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about maybe different ways that people can take care of themselves um, during the different phases of the moon? Yeah. So again, it kind of depends on how they're feeling these different phases. So part of the best way to do this is to track. So for a woman, this could be tracking their menstrual cycle. For someone not menstruating, this could be just finding a moon chart, you can Google that, and paying specific attention to possibly the new moon, the full moon, 
and then maybe moving into the quarter moons and just writing a sentence or two about what's going on. And that is really the best way to learn the self-care strategies that will work for an individual because they may be really different. Like we were just talking about for someone on the full moon, they might write down, um, loved having all of my friends over today for a big party. And that felt great. To someone else, they might write, had all of my friends over, I wanted to be in my room with my journal. <laughs> And so tracking in this way is really the best way to find those self-care practices since they'll look a little bit different for everyone. And so I suggest writing down things like maybe some big events that happened during that day or around the two to three days around that time. And then how that felt. And this can be as simple as writing down what what type of exercise you did that day. And it felt really good to go for a run or it felt really good to do some restorative yoga to find what kind of different things you'll need at different points in the cycle. And it could also be something as simple as writing down what food you ate. This felt really good to eat today. I loved smoothies. Like I needed thick stews and soups. That can be another way to kind of have these light airy foods bring us up or these grounding foods and learning what different times can feel most nourishing for those. Thank you, thank you. Um, and so another um, question I had too, so how is um, menstrual cycle awareness a spiritual practice and how might one benefit from living in accordance with the menstrual cycle? Yeah, so menstrual cycle awareness can be really thought of as an inner spiritual practice. Because as we develop this awareness of the subtle and sometimes really big shifts throughout the month that can happen in the body, the mind, and the spirit, we can cultivate a greater self-compassion and self-understanding. So during different parts of the cycle, we may notice that there are different connections that we have to a a spiritual being outside of ourselves or a divine sense or however you identify that. So in general, when we start to tune inwards every single day, if we're tracking our cycle and kind of looking at the cycle as a whole, we can start to develop this greater self-awareness and self-honor. And so that can really become this spiritual practice of self-knowing and really tuning into that deep inner knowing part of ourselves. So that like we were talking about the tracking, that we can start to know, and even before we get to that phase, what we're going to need, how we're going to respond, who we're going to need to ask for help. And then what kind of things we need to cultivate in ourselves so that we can feel supported during those phases. And uh, you, you did um, mention, um, I think a couple of times already, um, some differences maybe if, uh, if a woman doesn't have a cycle or is postmenopausal. Can you uh, just kind of explain, you know, what happens if, um, you know, with a woman that doesn't have a, you know, a menstrual cycle any longer? Yeah, so for someone who has had a cycle their whole life, a natural cycle their whole life, and then doesn't have a cycle anymore, there are a couple ways that you can continue to live in the cyclical way. So one is working with the moon. And again, that can work for any being. The other is if a woman has had a very consistent cycle, they may actually start to feel the same kind of energetic pulls in those same parts of the cycle. So even though they're not actually bleeding, maybe their cycle was a very specific 29 days. They can continue to track that. And that may actually feel a little bit more in tune with their body than the moon cycle, if they've mm -hmm. never really been attuned to the moon cycle in general. Mm -hmm. However, for most women especially going through a phase before menopause, it's called the perimenopause phase. There's a lot of hormonal shifts in there that can really 
make the period irregular for a while. So they may have felt a little bit out of this sink for quite a bit of time. And for those women, we usually start to guide back to the moon cycle because it's something so easy that we can look up. We can look up in the sky. We can check on a calendar when the next full and new moons are. And that can give them this really steady rhythm that maybe their body once had, but feels like it might not anymore. And then that way they can still feel like they're in this rhythm. They can still feel the ebbs and flows, even if they're not sure where their natural cycle was. Mm-hmm. Okay. That actually, that does uh, make a lot of sense. Um, and you did also mention too, you know, different different types of of moon rituals or different types of activities that you could do to, to coincide with the cycle of the moon or, you know, the cycle of yourself. Um, and in, on your website, you do mention yoga as being one of those, those core activities. Can you just elaborate a little bit more how uh, yoga uh, marries, you know, so perfectly with the cycle and any other activities that, you know, men and women can try? Absolutely. So yoga is one of the main modalities that I use in my classes and one-on-one with people. And I use that for really two main ways. The first is to specifically help women with certain discomforts around their cycle because it works with the endocrine system of the body. So it can normalize hormones and bring them back into balance. So things like irritability or cramping or heavy bleeding, we can work on those through yoga. Secondly, the one that works for everyone is that yoga is this holistic practice and it brings the student into a space of deeper self-knowledge so that we're able to understand what might be causing imbalances in any area of the life. And so throughout the cycles, when I teach yoga, we work with different types of yoga for different phases. So when we need to lift the energy up, we may be doing certain breathing practices, certain strength building exercises, certain standing pose poses or balancing poses that allow the student to feel really strong and energized. When we need to tone the energy down, we'll work on more yin poses or restorative poses to start to bring that energy back inwards. And so regardless of gender working in this cycle can be really beneficial for any yoga student because like we were saying similarly in the beginning when we were kind of talking about work and being in an environment under fluorescent lights, we could also approach our yoga practice the same way. If we're showing up at our mat and we tell ourselves we have to do this certain sequence, we have to do handstands, we have to get these hard poses, we have to hold them for a long time. Instead, what would it feel like to start with the yoga practice to make that a cycle? So the handstands are happening when it feels fun, when our body has the energy to, when it feels exciting to practice that. But some days we're laying in one restorative pose for a half an hour and that's the practice. And same thing goes here, releasing that shame from not feeling productive in our practice. But knowing that when we rest, that is also balancing our hormones. It's also balancing our minds and our spirits and our energy. It's also allowing our muscles to recover. And so in that way, we're able then to make it back to practicing our handstands. (laughs) That's beautiful. It's really, I think, you know, just coming back to listening to our bodies and when our bodies are saying, hey, it's it's time to go within, you know, it's time to have that restorative pose. Um, I don't have to do this vinyasa flow or, or whatever, like in, you know, in this um, intense way that, you know, I might, even though I've got this on my schedule, um, it might not feel like the time to do that. Um, And so I'm wondering too, you talk a lot about like the different cycles of the moon and everything. And I'm just curious if there are other cycles of the universe or cycles of the earth that you, you work with. Yeah. One of the main cycles that I work with is following the lunar calendar 
in terms of the equinoxes, the solstices, and the halfway points in between them. So it's also known as the wheel of eight because there's eight things that happen during the year. And what I love about that calendar is it doesn't really have a beginning or end. And I think that is such a cool thing because growing up in a culture myself where the year had this beginning and there was a certain stress to the beginning of have to make the goals, have to decide what I wanna do that year. Then there's the middle where we're really working to make sure those happen. And then there's the end that's like, how are you gonna end your year? And then we start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> but with this circle, every time that there's a holiday, they call it the turning of the wheel. And it just continually turns. It continues to turn before we're born, after we die. This is a continuation of the moon cycles. So that's a big one that I follow and will celebrate each of those periods of eight because I feel like they are really ways that eight times per year you can tune into what's happening. So it can be also a great place to start for those who are not ready to track every single day or every moon cycle but possibly tuning into these eight holidays that happen once a year. And there are each kind of, uh, I guess, rituals or um, celebrations that can happen for each of those holidays. That'd be a really beautiful way to really connect with the cycles of, you know, the, the universe, the lunar um, calendar, and, and really connect um, with your, your body um, to really listen to how that is changing and shifting. And um, I love that. So in, in one of your blogs too, you talk about creating rituals in your life and letting the earth carry your dreams. Can you explain how this coincides with living cyclically and how we can tune into that? Sure. So that blog post was inspired by a book called The Awakened Woman by Dr. Tarari Trent. And if you haven't read it, I would highly suggest it. It's one that I will be reading over and over again. But in this book, she talks about a practice that her mom taught her of writing her dream on a piece of paper and then burying it. And I just loved this practice so much because it brings us as humans away from our disconnection to nature. And instead it honors us as an active participant so that we are calling on nature to allow our dreams to come true and that we are realizing that we are part of nature. Many times we can get disconnected and think that there is this duality between humans and nature and instead thinking of how we are also nature. We are also made up of the same things. So in this way of literally burying a dream, so writing it on a piece of paper, burying it in the ground, it also allows for this surrender of how are we allowing the nature around us to support our dreams and not thinking that us as humans or as individuals are in our silos, trying to make our own dreams happen, which is how we can feel many times. And that's one of the beautiful things about ritual is it brings us closer to nature, to spirit, to a divine and realizes that we're all the same thing. And we're all in this experience together and we're all helping each other's dreams come true. We're not alone. That's, um... Yeah, I, uh, I find, you know, anything related to any type of dream work just really, really fascinating. Um, and, uh, but what one question I did have, so, you know, we, we've been talking um, a lot about tuning into nature and, uh, you know, how important that is to kind of get back to our, you know, true, pure selves. Um, so what about the the some of us that don't really have 
access to nature. You know, we live in the middle of a concrete jungle. You know, we, we could write our dreams down, but we can't necessarily bury them, you know, or, or other uh, nature rituals that we might not be able to do. Are there any types of alternatives that you could suggest for, for us like that? Absolutely. So when I run my women's circles, which I do every turn of that wheel of eight, we work a lot on creating an altar space. So it could just be a little corner of your house. It could be at the top of a bookshelf. So having a space that feels like a little sacred space to you. And that can be somewhere where you can bring in elements of nature. And so a way to do that would be having something to really represent the different things in nature. So there could be an element of wood, an element of fire, an element of water. So some of those might be uh, like a stick. It could be a flower, a dried flower. It could be a shell or for whatever it is that represents that for you. And so in that way, when we're building an altar space, that can be the sacred space that we're doing rituals with. So yes, it's a beautiful ideal to be out in nature, with trees all around us and mm -hmm. singing in a circle with humans. But many times that doesn't happen. So an altar space can be an alternative. And if you have a bit of a green thumb, you could grow a plant there or just whatever it is that represents those different elements to you. And then we can change those throughout the moon cycles or throughout the seasons so that we can put things to represent the cold and the quietness of winter or the blooming of spring or the excitement of summer. So then we can change the altar space to represent those changes of the year. Mm, that's, a, that's a very wonderful, wonderful um, just kind of way to, you know, if you can't go to nature to bring nature to you. Um, is there any specific you know does does the altar need to be stagnant or does it need to be in any specific direction at any certain period of time not in the practices that i teach it can really be anywhere at any time and yeah it's i think it's really individualized so i i think just a place where you can visit and see it often i really like to invite people to visit their altar daily even if it's just standing by it for one minute in the morning, reminding themselves of the different elements. And then of course, like we said, it can shift and change, but I really believe anywhere it can be. Awesome, thank you. I love that. And just, you know, for some of our listeners who might not have an altar or haven't ever created an altar, but have always been interested, um, are there certain things that you suggest someone might put on an altar? Yeah, so I would suggest using as many different elements of nature as you can. And again, those could be really representative. So you can decide if there's three things on your altar, what each of those represent. And so those could be actual elements in nature, such as wood and air and water. Or what we just did in the last women's circle that I ran, we created three words that we wanted to represent our whole next turning of the wheel and put three objects down that represented those three words. So for some people, those were different types of rocks or stones that they had around their house. For some people, those were paintings. For some people, they were um, like a bookmark. <laughs> it could really be anything that really invokes those ideas that you want to have. So since you are visiting it possibly every morning, what is something that you want to be reminded of? Is it your connection to nature? Is it reminding yourself that you are made of the same thing as trees and you have some kind of plant there? Is it more of a, a word, something that you kind of want to bring forward as an intention and then something that represents that. So there really is no right or wrong way to have an altar. And I encourage people to just kind of put anything out there in a corner of the room and see what feels good. 
for myself personally, I will change mine all the time. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. Thank you for saying that. Cause I think it is very individualized and I think for someone who might overthink it and, you know, it's nice to have some ideas. I know for, um, my altar, my, my altar has actually grown quite, um, big over the years that used to be really small. Now I have like this table that I, you know, I've got my stones and my statues of my deities and, um, you know, my sage and just different symbols that are really important to me. So, um, so yeah, I think that's beautiful. And cause and it's also like that ever flowing changing uh, of the energy that we're in. So it sounds like, you know, just whatever is feeling right to you in that moment doesn't have to be, that, you know, static or, you know, can be whatever feels right. Um, just like with yeah. the seasons, definitely. And it can just be something that you have in your house too. You know, it's a common misconception that there needs to be the crystals and the statues mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. these kind of uh, things that we see as spiritual, but for anyone, anything can be spiritual. Mm -hmm. I really love that, that you uh, yeah. said that too. Um, when uh when i was growing up the the people that i surrounded myself with we always said um you know actually at, at one point in time my you know my higher power my god were my shoes because my shoes helped to get me where i needed to be mm -hmm. you know and um and that's that's just, just it's a always a really refreshing uh take for me when you know when somebody does say you know just you have your if you have your intention in whatever object um and that object brings you joy or peace or you know something then that is a sacred spiritual object it doesn't matter what it is you know as long as it's it, you know you have a connection and it makes you feel a certain way and you put you know your best intentions into it and i just i i i, I love that too because i am i am actually one of those people that i tried to get like really into crystals and I just got way overwhelmed, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so I have a few stones now, but, um, but yeah, it's just nice for, you know, for people like, like me that, you know, aren't as well versed into, you know, crystals or, you know, um, statues or shrines or something like that, that it could literally be anything. So I, I really appreciate you saying that. That was really yeah, awesome. Absolutely. I have a friend who chooses coffee mugs. So she chooses one per year and that's going to be her spiritual coffee mug because she drinks out of it every morning. So instead of having a physical altar space, she picks a mug and that's mm. going to be her spiritual thing for the year. It's so like you said, it can really be anything and you don't have to be a crystal person or a statue person to feel that spirituality. Some people love that. And for some people, it doesn't resonate as well. And anything like you said that was a great example i love that because it's really the meaning we give it and when we can connect to the meaning behind whatever object we choose it's what is going to ultimately help us just create that that meaning behind it and that intention so right. so just to kind of switch gears for a minute um so spring equinox um, is coming up and I know, um, you know, the seasons um, are changing. And so um, I know you, you mentioned on your blogs, just some different rituals or things people can do to uh, celebrate that. I'm wondering if you can tell us some ways that, that we can celebrate uh, the spring equinox um, as it's coming up. Yeah, absolutely. It actually ties right into our altar conversation because the spring equinox is celebrating the sprouting of ideas and passion and relationships. Mm. In order to allow this arising energy, we also need to clear some space. So one of the first things that I do is create a ritual of cleaning. So we call this spring cleaning. Mm. <laughs> and you could either do this in the home, in your car, <laughs> Oh, or on your altar. It can actually be a great time to decide what doesn't need to be there anymore. Maybe what was standing in that place that was just there for something pretty, but doesn't have much meaning. 
And it can be maybe time to either take that thing away to give that more meaning coming up or to just let it find a different space in your home. And this could also just happen with your closet or your kitchen. Anytime that we're intentionally creating space, that can be a really beautiful ritual for the spring to come. And then another practice that I would suggest is finding a place where you can start to write down your ideas. Because as we talked about with the waning moon, as well as the pre-ovulatory phase for women, it also mirrors the springtime. So what that means is our energy is starting to slowly increase and the creativity and ideas in our mind might start to flow. So it could look like going through some of the main areas of your life, such as relationship, business, health, or finances, and just writing down what ideas are coming up for you. So really allowing yourself some time to just let those come up because in our minds, which are working all day long, a lot of what we spend our time doing is saying, shh, I'm working <laughs> or shh, I'm trying to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I'm trying to write down my grocery list. But instead what we may start to notice right around the spring is that we have these ideas popping up. And so later in the year, later, later in this wheel of eight, we can start to get more into the discerning what things we want to pull out of those ideas and what we really want to nourish. But the springtime is just about letting all of that energy come up. It's this, this energy of these sprouting thoughts and very much this childlike energy. So when you watch a kid coming up with games of imagination, you know, they have like this wild big plan and they make this whole game and it lasts for like seven and a half minutes and then it's done. And then they have another one. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's kind of the energy that we can tune into. And that can be especially helpful as adults because we often put our own self into boxes of this is my job. These are my relationships. This is how I show up in the world. But what if we just allowed a little bit of time to say, what if I showed up this way? What if I did this in my job? And we don't necessarily have to act on them yet, but it can be a really healthy thing just to let those ideas flow. So like I said, finding somewhere, it could be a note on your phone. It could be in your journal every night. It could be on the back of your grocery list, <laughs> but allowing those ideas to come up can be a really beautiful way to honor the spring equinox. I love, I love all those ideas. Um, and I do uh, love, you know, how you mentioned too, not only is it a time for, you know, rejuvenation to kind of, you know, shed off uh, old skin or, you know, but also it's a time to, you know, tap into your childlike wonderment, you know, and um, I think that's, you know, that's a, that's something that a lot of us as adults, we, we, uh, we miss it, you know, we either forget about it or we are conditioned to lock it away, you know, and, and we need to, you know, we need the, the solid jobs and, you know, the house and the, the 2.5 kids and, you know, the two car garage or, you know, just, you know, whatever. But, um, but even for, you know, the most professional of, of us, tapping into that childlike wonderment is it's it it does wonders you know and it's not just for and uh in, in my personal opinion anyway it's not just for you know for for specific creativities like art creativity or music creativity or something like that it could be like you said changing things up at work your creativity at work you know it could be for a big project that you're working on or a promotion or something like that to tap into that childlike wonderment and that rejuvenation and it, it it does nothing but good you know it does nothing but pay dividends so i i appreciate again you you mentioning the you know the child because that is something that a lot of us just completely forget about yeah and like you said the more that you work with that the greater it gets mm -hmm. and so the more that we practice that creativity the more that it grows 
and the more that it ripples to the people around us. So you could be the first one at your job to say, maybe we do something a little bit different mm -hmm. and see how people react. And it sounds like it's just really about tuning in again, tuning inward to listen to the cycles of the seasons, to tapping into the energy of the spring and what that truly means. And, you know, not forcing anything, but allowing things to flow through you um, and being open to those ideas. Yeah, exactly. And it is this, this spring and the spring equinox, especially being the very beginning of spring, it's just this start to like turn on of the valve of our energy. So that's why creating this space for the creativity, for the ideas to flow, we don't need to necessarily take them and run with them right away. We don't necessarily need to squash the ones that seem ridiculous. Right now we're just letting them be there. And then further into the seasons, we can start to say, okay, this, this one is gonna work. I'm gonna pick this one and we're gonna work on this one. But right now for this spring, it's really just letting the ideas be there. And like you said, Sam, it's, that can be a really great practice for adults, just to let there be ideas. And we don't necessarily have to do them or have to not do them, but they're just there. It's just creative. It's just imagination. That's great. Dreaming yeah. big. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And yeah, I mean, that's, you know, yeah, it's just like, like you just said, Stacy, dreaming big. You know, and that's, you know, when we were children, what do we dream of? You know, we, we dreamt to be a, a firefighter or we dreamt to be a doctor or we dreamt to be a superhero. You know, we, the, the sky was the limit. Why can't the sky still be the limit? You know? Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Mia, can you uh, just tell our listeners, fill, uh, fill them in on, uh, on how they can find you and what you're currently working on? Yeah, absolutely. So my next couple things coming up are I do a women's circle every turning of the wheel. So if you're listening to this podcast on one of the first days that it comes out, I will be doing a spring equinox women's circle. If you miss that one, I'll be doing one eight times a year. <laughs> and we do uh, little rituals, little movement practices for about an hour long ritual. I also have a five week deep dive into menstrual cycle awareness for the women who want to know more about that. The next one will start April 25th. And I also work one on one with clients. I usually work for three months at a time so that we can work through an entire season together and start to learn what the bigger picture of that season looks like and then what the smaller seasons of either the menstrual cycle or the moon look like for that individual. And you can find all of the offerings on my website, which is movecreateradiate.com. And on the offerings tab, you can see all of those offerings coming up. And as we referenced a couple of times, I have a blog on there as well. So if you want to go a little bit deeper into some of the things we talked about, there are a couple blog posts up there where you can view some rituals and learn more about the moon cycles as well. Awesome. And we will uh, go ahead and add your uh, website and any other uh, relevant links to our show notes as well. That way, you know, our listeners can just get right to you and see all the amazing things that you offer and all the amazing blogs that you have. So we appreciate that. Perfect. And so thank you, Mia, for being here with us today and sharing your experience with us. And thank you all for listening to our show. Stay tuned for more episodes being released on Mondays at 5.55 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And if you like this show, share the love by sharing it with your friends. And if you want to support the work we're doing, please consider make a do making a donation to our show by visiting our Patreon website at patreon.com forward slash be the love podcast and until next time love yourself love each other and love the world we love you guys love you thank you heather lynn for providing us with your beautiful song to accompany our show be the love if you would like to learn more about heather lynn and her music please visit her website at heatherlynnmusic.com and thank you, Chrissy Grace at Leading Edge Productions for the beautiful design and graphics. And thank you for tuning in. And until next time, we are souls on the journey. And thank you for hopping on the Ascension bus with us. And remember, there is always a seat for you.